Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Success Thursday this week with Mariana Trigo. Hi, Mariana. Welcome back. Hello. Thank you. All right. So, of course, Thursdays are the success question, but we always start with the favorite retrospective format. So what is your choice retrospective format, Mariana? I think retrospectives were the thing that really got me in love by this role. I really love it. And when I speak about retrospectives, I always say that they are the thing that characterize the IT sector, which is constantly improving, being better, understanding what went well, what's working, what's not working. And over the times, I, I changed a little bit. I think in the beginning, I was only doing like what went well and not so well. And then I started adopting icebreakers. That was like one of the best conquers for the teams, especially when they don't know each other. So I always do uh, maybe 5, 10, maximum 15 minutes icebreaker in the beginning. It can be a simple game that people already know. When we were remotely, we had to be a bit more creative on like sending pictures of your shoes. So everyone was sending like flip-flops or <laughs> uh, some ugly <laughs> shoes that you have at home. The hidden part of the video calls. Yes. <laughs> it was very funny because we sent the pictures and then people had to guess who, who were those fits <laughs> from. So it was very nice and very fun. And then we usually after the icebreaker, uh, we have some time to write down Trello cards or if you are in the office, post it for you to think what went well and not so well during that sprint. So each person will write several subjects that they think they, they need to talk about and we will prioritize them. This was a thing that I also added later in time because sometimes we had so many subjects and we could easily get lost about the things that were really important to speak about. Uh, so now we do like a little voting. You need to choose the three that for you are the most important to speak about. And then we basically check the score and we put them top down, organized by priority for the team. And then one by one, we speak about, okay, so what does this mean? Uh, what is the reason behind origin? What happened? What didn't? And if needed, we define an action, like action points, action steps, and an owner to complete it. Like someone inside the team that can be anyone that will be the responsible one to drive that possible solution. So that has been our, our format. Icebreaker what went well and not so well, prioritize, speak about it, take the action and the owner. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, we've talked about this here on the podcast, this uh, idea of prioritizing the cards and then discussing them in turn. There's a format called Lean Coffee, which really fits this type of approach. And uh, I really like the idea of building an icebreaker, maybe even having an icebreaker that is different every retro, right? There's mm -hmm. lots of resources out there. I can put a note here for myself to share an icebreaker link that has uh, 30 plus icebreakers. So that's already more than half a year. And if you <laughs> include vacation, it's almost the whole year awesome. of icebreakers. And the idea is that the icebreaker puts us in a totally different mood. It establishes a clear boundary between what was before the retro and what is the retro. It kind of says, okay, now this is the retro. It's not just another meeting. It's the retro. And then the other thing is that puts everybody in a much more open and relaxed and hopefully also sharing and understanding mood. Yeah, that's for sure. It's totally different the mood that you had before. And when the, the team is already used to do it, they come into the retrospective a lot more motivated already. One of the tricks that we also use is um, every sprint, one person of the team will decide what icebreaker will we do. So it gets even funnier because then they challenge each other on how uncomfortable the icebreaker will be. <laughs> That's a sign of a great team, right? It's when <laughs> yeah, they start yeah. to push the boundaries on the icebreaker activity. <laughs> that little crazy part of the team. So there are some people that immediately say, come on, nothing touchy, nothing physical. I don't like that. Then they bring something like, uh, okay, uh, but you'll have to sing. Okay, no <laughs> singing, please. <laughs> so there are really a lot of things to explore and also to take people out of their comfort zone uh, because then they will laugh about each other, right? So it might feel yeah, a bit and hard. Laughing totally changes the atmosphere. Yeah. Even when the team already know each other for, for some time, when they are all um, strangers, let's say, 
it's like essential, totally essential, because uh, you can use icebreakers that will get them to know each other. For example, in the beginning, when I'm joining a new team, the first icebreaker I bring is always the um, two truths and one lie. That's always the one about ourselves, like a thing that I usually do, where did I went traveling, some funny facts about my life. And they do the same about themselves. And usually what happens is they will get to know me well or a, a little bit better, of course. And even between them, they will share things that they didn't know about each other. Like I love cooking or I hate cooking or I hate some kind of food and so on. So, But we do all of these things because we want to succeed as a scrum master, right? So that's the next question we want to explore. So for you, Mariana, what's the definition of success for a scrum master? Uh, the first thing that I always thought about, am I doing the right work with this team or not? is understanding if the process is working for them or not, both for them and for the company. Because on every context that I've been, both companies were very technology-driven. So the technology teams were like the core of the business. And if, if the process was not working for them, it was not working for the team at the same time. But I would say your specific measure of success, if we want something specific, it will depend a lot on the type of the company you are in. For example... When I was on the startup, for me, the measure of success was really to understand if we were able to keep a process, given that our variables were constantly changing, changing, changing. So we would be succeeding if we were uh, having the opportunity to have this project during several weeks and the team was able to understand what ceremonies do we have and what will we deliver from time to time. So that was for sure our biggest need during those times. Also, one of the measures of success was our relationship with the product department because it was a very demanding part uh, on that specific context. Even though the team was already knowing what process are we following, why are we doing retros, why are we doing planning sessions, the connection with the product team was still very poor. So that was also one of our measures of success. When the context was shifting, when projects were taking in and out and priorities were changing, we had to make sure that the technical team, the development team, still trusts in the product team because those our product owners were constantly changing and they were very apart. They were like arriving, telling us the requirements, and then they disappeared during the rest of the sprint. And that cannot happen. So our measure of success back then was really the connection between between the product department and the engineering department. And actually, so if I if I take that idea, the relationship you mentioned, the relationship with the product department, but I, I would take that idea and kind of turn it all the way up to 11, which is find who the critical stakeholders are and ask yourself, how's the relationship with them, right? In your case, it was the product department, but it could be finance, could be sales, could be a team in another company, could be any of those. Yeah, it, it depends a lot on the context. So you really need to find out like what's the pain point for the team that is not making them available to progress. And in that context, as a startup, it was we had that huge challenge of things constantly changing. But one thing that we knew that would be constant is the relationship with the product team because they would be always the ones bringing us the requirements and selling us the product or the feature that we would build. So if at least that part was good, if they trust each other, if they understand the needs and the pains, once again, of each other, um, at least we would have success on that part. And that's a very strong core thing to have. Absolutely. As a, a great set of questions and guidelines to think about when evaluating our own success. Thank you for sharing that, Mariana. Of course. Part of a successful Scrum Master job is to help the product owner. Tomorrow we explore that critical role in Scrum, the product owner role. Tune in to learn about product owner anti-patterns, what you can do to help the product owner, and a real-life example of what a great product owner is and what made it so. Tomorrow on our Friday product owner episode. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.